you guys for coming. Uh, just like Karen said, I really appreciate seeing uh, seeing you guys tonight in this uh, bad weather. Um, if I were you, I would uh, go home and have a hot chocolate and maybe watch Game of Thrones or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so thank you so much for coming. So, uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Ahmed Saleh. I'm a periodontist. Um, I did my undergraduate uh, in Egypt. That's where I'm from originally. And then I came to Australia 10 years ago. I did my ATC exams. And then I did my perio uh, specialty study at UWA. And uh, I've been working as a periodontist for the last uh, four years. So today I'm going to talk to you about prognosis of periodontally compromised teeth. And the reason why I really like talking about that topic is that as a postgraduate student, it was always <coughs> difficult for me to assign a prognosis for periodontally compromised teeth. And it was particularly scary to give a tooth a hopeless prognosis because once I'd say that, then this means that the tooth has to come out. And I always wanted, wasn't sure whether this is really the right thing to do. So I want to show you how my thoughts have changed the past few years and I hope I can maybe share a few of my thoughts with you today. So let's start with the beginning. What is prognosis? The word prognosis really means foreknowledge. So in other words, it's your ability to predict something that's going to happen before it actually happens. And when you look at the dictionary and look at different definitions, you will see all of those different vague, non-definitive words. Hello? Sorry, I'm late. Not a problem. <laughs> Okay, so, so, so let's start again with the definition of uh, prognosis. So the word prognosis, as I said, it means foreknowledge. And so in other words, it's the, it's the ability of someone to predict something that's going to happen before it actually happens. And when you look at the dictionary and look at the <coughs> definitions, you will always see those um, vague and non-definitive words, like the likely course of a medical condition or an opinion based on some experience or a forecast of the likely outcome of a situation. So none of these are actually very clear uh, definitions and very clear words. And when it comes to the prognosis of periodontally compromised teeth, there's a lot of levels that we need to look at and a lot of different factors that we need to look at. But for the sake of this lecture, just to make it simple for you, I would like to show you what the literature has generally described teeth with a questionable prognosis and what the literature has generally prescribed teeth with a hopeless prognosis. So teeth with a questionable prognosis are usually those where there is bone loss of 50 to 70 uh, percent or in case of molar teeth, these that have a furcation of grade 2 furcation involvement. And the literature has generally described teeth with a hopeless prognosis as those that have lost bone for up more than 70%, just like that one, and in case of molar furcations, those that have a grade 3 furcation involvement. So these are the definitions that we're going to use for the rest of this lecture and this presentation. Now, before we talk about management of these different teeth that are periodontally compromised, Let's ask a couple of questions, and I'll try to answer these questions with you. So the first question is, how accurate are we at determining the prognosis of periodontally compromised teeth? So in other words, if I look at this tooth, and I ask you, what do you guys think about the prognosis of this tooth? If someone tells me this tooth is, is, is questionable, I don't see it that, that it's going to live for the coming two years, is that really accurate? Is that really correct? And the other question that we will answer is, how hasty are we as dentists and clinicians at making the decision to extract periodontally compromised teeth? So let's answer both of these questions now. Starting with the first one, how accurate are we at determining the prognosis of periodontally compromised teeth? So in order to answer that question, I'd like to show you this study and all periodontists know this study. It is really a classical study by the McGuire group. So what these people did is they had a group of patients, all of them had periodontal disease, and they assigned for each and every tooth and for each and every patient one of those categories of prognosis. Good, fair, poor, 
questionable and hopeless. And even the ones that were considered hopeless, according to the definitions that I'm giving you, they didn't necessarily extract these teeth, okay? So these teeth just stayed in the patient's mouth. And they did the periodontal treatment that they, that they thought was the right thing for the patient, and they maintained these patients for eight years, eight years of periodontal maintenance. And what they wanted to see is how much percent of the teeth, for example, that were given a good prognosis after eight years were still good prognosis. And how much, for example, percent of these, those that were given a questionable prognosis at the end of the eight years stayed questionable, and how much went to a better prognosis, and how much went to a lesser prognosis. And they made this very complicated table, which I'm just going to do a bit of cutting and pasting, just to get to the point that I want to get here. So for the teeth that were initially given a good prognosis, at the end of eight years, 85% of those teeth was, were still a good prognosis. So that's pretty high, that's pretty accurate. And only a small percentage went to a lesser prognosis. So that's not bad. But do you know how much percent of the teeth that were initially given a questionable prognosis at the end of the eight years, do you know how much percent stayed questionable? Zero percent. None of them were still questionable. As a matter of, uh, of fact, the vast majority of the teeth, 75%, went to a better prognosis, and only 25 or 26% went to a lesser prognosis. So at the end of the eight years, teeth that were given a good prognosis were still good at the end of the eight years, so that was relatively stable. Fair prognosis has generally improved. Even the poor and the questionable has also generally improved. And even the teeth that were considered hopeless, after eight years, 25% of these teeth were still retained in the patient's mouth. And so therefore, the good prognosis category was consistently correct to a very high extent. But if a category shift was made, it was usually to a better prognosis. And the over, this is what they determined, that at the, at the overall accuracy after eight years for, uh, for us giving a prognosis to a tooth is only 35%. So only 35% of the time when you think that this tooth is questionable or hopeless or whatever, you are correct. Only 35%. So the conclusion that they've made here is, again, back to our question, how accurate are we at determining the prognosis of periodontally compromised teeth? The answer here is we are generally not very, ac not very accurate, it's quite ineffective. So let's answer the next question now. How hasty are we as clinicians at making a decision to extract a tooth that is periodontally compromised? And in order to answer that question, I'd like to show you this study. It's a German study. It's not an Australian study, but we can possibly relate to it. So what this study looked at is they wanted to see what is the dentist's forceps level. So in other words, at what level of bone loss or loss of attachment do most dentists feel that this tooth need to come out? So what they did is they collected 500 teeth that were all extracted by dentists for periodontal reasons, not for caries, not for purely for periodontal reasons. And under the microscope, they can look at the root surface and they can see how much percent of that root surface has lost attachment and how much still had attachment. And they found that the vast majority of these teeth were extracted when there was still an attachment of 50 to 70 percent along the root length. And this was just considered a really low threshold for extraction of teeth for periodontal reasons and they called for an improvement in the knowledge of periodontal diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment planning. So to answer our question here, how are we too hasty in making the decision to extract? The answer is, according to that study, is possibly yes. So what I've learned through the, out of my few years of experience is, because we are not good at determining prognosis of periodontally compromised teeth, according to that study that I've just shown you, and because I don't want to be hasty in making a decision to extract, so instead of, instead of looking at the, 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 that half empty 
a, a part of the talk where we just of the class where we just say uh, how likely is it for me to extract to, for this tooth to be lost? Maybe I should look at it in a different way. I should give each and every tooth the benefit of the doubt, and instead of looking at this green look of what is the likelihood for this tooth to be lost, no, actually look in the other way and say how can I, what can I do, and how can I possibly change the prognosis of that tooth to to a better prognosis. So this was a very, very long introduction. Now let's talk about the management of these different teeth that, we, that are periodontally compromised. So I'm going to categorize it for you into single rooted teeth, so no, not molars, uh, questionable prognosis, as I've described it before, 50 to 70% bone loss, hopeless prognosis, which is more than 70% bone loss, as we've shown, and then combined combined endoperiod lesion, which is what I call more than 100% bone loss, and I'll explain to you why, why I call it that in a second. And then we've got multi-rooted teeth, so molars, with furcation involvement, sorry, uh, without furcation involvement, so again, questionable, hopeless, and combined, and then multi-rooted teeth, and this time with furcation involvement, so questionable would be the grade 2 furcation, hopeless would be grade 3 furcation, and combined endoperiod would be more than 100% bone loss. And again, just to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to put these two together, okay, in one of the same category, because essentially, there's no difference between that, prim that defect on that premolar and that defect on that molar, as long as there's no furcation involvement present. But then, those two are very different from this one, where there is actually a furcation involved. So again, so let's bring them together. So now we're talking about multi-rooted teeth, or single rooted teeth without furcation involvement, questionable, hopeless, combined endoperio, and then multi rooted teeth with furcation involvement, grade 2, grade 3, and combined endoperio. Does that all make sense? Okay, so let's start with the beginning now. Oh, this is, this is something I wanted to say here. So I, I just want to show you that, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a random hippie uh, tooth hugger who just wants to you know, say it's really, really about the, the evidence. So I'm going to show you with all of these examples the evidence that supports that, and it's all in green for you to if you, if you, if you, just to attract, you know, attract your attention. So let's start around with the beginning. Single rooted teeth or multi rooted teeth, no vacation involvement, and starting with those that are questionable problems. So this is the first example here. This is a lower premolar that has, according looking at the extra here, it's lost bone to about 50, 60 percent. The probing depth on that tooth is seven millimeters. And again, we always start with non-surgical periodontal debridement. Give the patient good oral hygiene instructions, and you can see as a result of that there is radiographic evidence of bone gain, and the probing depth has also reduced from sevens to threes and fours. Here's another example again of the distal of that seven, angular bone loss almost to again 50-60% bone loss, probing depth is 7 millimeters, and just by non-surgical periodontal debridement, good oral hygiene, again you have, you can see radiographic evidence of bone gain, and the probing depth has gone down from 7 to 3 millimeters. So the evidence behind that is actually not new evidence. And that's why I intentionally put this study just to show you that there's nothing really new in what I'm talking about. So what this study has done, this is also a classical study by the Batterstein group. What they did is they, they looked at, in patients now, a teeth that have lost attachment or have probing depth up to seven millimeters, like the one that I've just shown you now. Yeah? And all they did was scaling and root planing and oral hygiene instructions. And they followed these teeth for 13 months. Initially, they had 106 sites of that type of uh, uh, probing depth. And at the end of the 13 months, only 13 sites still had the 7 millimeter probing depth. So the vast majority of these 106 sites have improved. Does that make sense? All right. So. Let's then, so we'll finish talking about the questionable prognosis. Let's now go a little bit deeper. Those that are described by the literature in general as hopeless, which have 70% or more bone loss. So this is an, an example here. This is a case that, I've, uh, that was referred to me by a prosthodontist. This patient's main concern is that she's not happy with that anterior bridge. So the bridge is really, there's a pontic here. 
and there is two abutments on both sides, and the prosthodontist was quite worried about that lateral incisor, because the probing depth on that lateral incisor was 10 and 9 millimeters. And when you look at the radiograph, you can see, as described by the literature, this is what can be considered as hopeless by a lot of people, a lot of people. so more than 70% bone loss. But what we did again is just non-surgical redundant debridement, good oral hygiene instructions, and as a result, the probing depth has gone down from 9s and 10s to 4s. And one maintenance after the other, that was quite stable. And we were confident enough because with regular maintenance, it's just stable and it's not getting it, 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 it's it's not getting any worse. We were quite confident for a new bridge to be fabricated, and the patient is just on regular periodontal maintenance. Again, here's another example. Now, this time you've got bone loss almost to a hundred percent. This is not a communicating endoperiodesion yet. This tooth is responding to sensibility test. And the probing depth here is 12 millimeters. But then again, non-surgical periodontal debridement, good oral hygiene, you can see the bone gain from here to here. Yes, there's a fair bit of recession, and, but the probing depth has definitely gone down from 12 to 13, <coughs> and there is definitely a shift in the category of prognosis from a very poor or hopeless prognosis to a more favorable prognosis, right? Here's another example. This is uh, not my case. This is actually uh, Albert's case. Albert Ter, who is my, my he's the periodontist that I, I work with. Um, so again, uh, this this to, uh, this tooth here, the, the dentist actually the dentist's recommendation was immediate extraction and implant placement. But Albert thought that okay, well maybe we shouldn't jump into that just yet. So again, he did his periodontal debridement. The probing depth here was nine millimeters, and now it's again you can see improvement radiographically and you can see reduction in probing depth from 9 to 3 millimeters. So, alright, so let's talk about evidence then. So the same Mathers team group, this time they looked at teeth and sites with probing depth of up to 12 millimeters. So they, started, and all they did again was just scaling and root planing, followed these teeth up for 24 months Initially, they started with 305 sites, and at the end of the 24 months, out of the 305, only 43 sites were still that deep. And one thing that was noticed here with those deeper sites is that the improvement is actually more gradual, and it takes up to nine months. So if you do your debridement and you don't see the improvement that you were hoping for in the first two, three months, Still, extraction is not the solution. You can just wait a little bit longer and you can get even further improvement up to nine months. So always start with the most conservative treatment, non-surgical debridement. And I hope I've shown you in those examples and those couple of studies that non-surgical treatment outcomes are not necessarily compromised by the severity of the initial lesion. Now, the next question is, so I've shown you that there are, there are not much, but there are a few sites that can still be persistent and still have deep pockets and not improved by non-surgical debridement. So the next step question is, so what do we do for these teeth? Is it time now to extract them? But the answer to that question is no, because you still have lots of other options to do other than extraction. And periodontal surgery here becomes quite useful. And there's a lot to talk about periodontal surgery. There's so many categories and so many uh, ways of classifying it. But just to classify it in a very broad way, periodontal surgery can either be just an open flap debridement, so razor flap, debride, and suture, or it can be a, a periodontal flap debridement in addition to also do, attempting some periodontal regeneration. So let's talk about each one of them. Periodontal flap debridement, uh, open flap debridement first. So this is again an example of a uh, that lower canine. Again, there is bone loss more than 70 or 80 percent, and the probing depth here was up to 12 millimeters. This is not my case. I got this case from a book, but I'll tell you why I wanted to show you that particular case. And then again, so the, dent the, the, the dentist did the open flap debridement. This is the buccal view. This is the lingual view, and then. This is the result. So once again, reduction in probing depth, radiographic evidence of the of bone gain, 
shift of prognosis from a very poor to hopeless prognosis to a more favorable prognosis. And this is a seven year follow up. And that's why I wanted to show you that case. I still don't have seven year follow ups. But, but this is again an example of how these things are quite sustainable, yeah? So that's open flap deprivement. What about periodontal regeneration? So again, very, very briefly, I'll, I'll tell you what periodontal regeneration is all about. We know that after we do our deprivement, there are four cell types that are racing and fighting against each other, wanting to populate that root surface. So there are cells from the epithelium, there are cells from the connective tissue, cells from the bone, and cells from the periodontal ligament. So they're all racing and wanting to populate that root surface. And we know that it's the cells from the periodontal ligament fibers that we want them to go onto that root surface for regeneration to be successful. So if you are running a race and you want to win that race, there's two ways you can win that race. Either you create obstacles for the other runners, or you run faster, or run as fast as you can. And this is exactly what the two types of periodontal regeneration are. So guided tissue regeneration is creating obstacles for the others, and the use of biologically active regenerative material, m game, which I'm, I guess you might have heard about it, is something that promotes the periodontal ligament cells to run faster. So let's look at a couple of examples here. So the first example is the guided tissue regeneration. So again, it's all about using a membrane. So here's an example of a tooth, and you can start with, with this type of uh, angular bone defect, and again, almost to 70% of the, of the root. This is after raising a flap, and you can see the defect here, and then a membrane is placed on top of the defect, once again, to exclude those unwanted cells, and only allow the cells from the periodontal ligaments to go up onto that root surface, and as a result, you can get that type of result. So again, shift of prognosis from very poor to more favorable. Here's an example of periodontal regeneration with an endogame running faster. So this is this is the, how the endogame looks. So this is a, a tooth. This is a lower canine with bone loss almost almost to the apex of the tooth. And uh, this is after raising the flap. You can see the defect here, and you can see again as a result the bone gain that has happened from here to there. Now I have to say that in Periodontal regeneration is it's, it's, it's a real thing, okay? And 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 the, the way that we you know that periodontal regeneration actually happens is through animal studies, where all of these things that are these are I'm showing you here uh, patients, but but animals have uh, lots of these studies have been done on animals. And then you sacrifice the animal and you look under the microscope, and you can see you can see bone gain, you can see periodontal ligament, you can see cementum. Unfortunately, you can't sacrifice our patients, but this is. Uh, all quite evident through animal studies. Okay, so we finished talking about this category. Now let's ne talk about the next one, combined endoperial lesion, uh, which is more than 100% bone loss. So this is an example of, uh, just to get our definitions right, so this is uh, what Paul Abbott uh, uh, and, and the dental school at UWA prefers to call it. And I think it, it's, it's quite a, it's a self-explanatory uh, um, uh, term. So it's a concurrent endoperiodontal disease with communication. So there is a periodontal lesion and there's an endodontic lesion and they both communicated with each other. And again, in the literature, uh, uh, this, this study by Paul Abbott, he again acknowledges that conditions, such concurrent diseases and the ones that are communicating, they have a very poor prognosis. But the same thing, the prognosis cannot be easily determined until you start the treatment and then you see how it's going to respond and I'll show you an example in a second. So here's an example, this is a case that was also referred to me a few years back. So this patient, his complaint was that uh, I can feel a little bit of pain when I, when I touch the tooth like this. And when you look at the periapical radiograph, there's a little bit of change of bone density here. So I referred this patient to, for a CT scan. And now you can see that there is actually, uh, just to get your bearings right, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the CT scan. So this is the palatal and this is the labial. And you can see that there is no bone all along the labial surface in, onto and beyond 
the apex of the tooth, right? So that's what I mean by more than 100% bone loss. And the probing depth on that tooth was 13 millimeters. And the tooth was not responding to pulp test. So this is a communicating endoperio disease. So what do you do? You follow the protocol. So the first step is I sent it to Paul Abbott. He be began the root canal treatment. He placed some intracanal medication. And then I did the non-surgical root debridement. And then you review the patient after three months. If there is a signs of periodontal healing, so reduction in probing depth, then you can finish the root canal treatment. If there isn't, then you can be repeat again those steps. So Paul Abbott, another uh, intracanal dressing, and then I will do the periodontal debridement. And you can do it surgically or non-surgically. I, I did it non-surgically in that case. And then see the patient after three months and we'll have a look again. If there is favorable improvement in periodontity, then finish the root canal treatment. If not, then by the third time, you, want, you can try a third time, or then you can tell the patient, look, this is not improving, maybe better have it out. And that's what, between Paul and I, that's what we did. We did that three times. But then at the end of the three times, the tooth ended up with a three millimeter probing depth, no mobility, no tenderness to percussion, completely asymptomatic, and Paul finished the root canal treatment. I would have loved to take another CT scan to see how that has changed, but most likely, if I, I, mean I didn't, but most likely if I would, I would see that there is very apical healing, and probably there's not going to be bone here, but it would be a very long junctional epithelium. So it's a soft tissue attachment, but that is an excellent and a very reliable form of healing, right? Okay, so we finished talking about single root teeth or molar teeth without furcation involvement. So, and I hope that I've shown you so far that you can get good improvement with non-surgical management or with periodontal surgery, either open flap deprivement or periodontal regeneration. And the aim is always to change the prognosis of the tooth from a very guarded prognosis to a more favorable prognosis. Does any, anyone have any questions so far? Should I continue? All right, so. so sorry, um, no problems. I was just wondering, each of those options possibly what were the regimens and the frequency of treatment? Yeah. What was that, sorry? What are the regimen and the frequency of treatment? Um, you know, is it once every six weeks, two weeks? For for, for which treatment are we talking about? Um, yeah. So let's say it's a uh, question of prognosis, you know, do you see them? Oh I see. Okay. So so look the the, 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 the general the general idea is you start with your non-surgical deployment or hygiene instructions, you review the patient after two months, you reassess the prognosis, and then you decide what you want to do next. Should I do periodontal surgery? Should I just continue non-surgically? And then you just go on. Okay, okay. now let's now uh, move on to the uh, multi-rooted teeth and now with furcation in focus. So starting with the first one, questionable prognosis, which is a grade two furcation in so this is an example of a case that I've had a while back. And this tooth had a, this patient had a lower seven. And as you can see, there's a grade two furcation here. So I started just like usual, non-surgical deprivement. And then I saw the patient a couple of months later and I probed the furcation and I can't feel it. And then I took the x-ray and you, I, you can see that there is, there is actually signs of closure of that grade two furcation. Look, I'm not going to lie to you, this is not something that I see every day, but that's exactly what I'm trying to say, that unless you start and treat and, and, and see how you go, you won't be able to see those results, right? Here's another example again, this time it's an upper motor. So again, you can see the, this, this tooth had a 10 millimeter probing depth on the distal, and there was a grade two furcation on the distal as well. And with non-surgical debridement, again, you can see the bone signs of bone gain from here to here. So it's not a 10 millimeter anymore, it's a five millimeter and the furcation involvement is a one. It's easy to maintain now and it's quite accessible. But again, so always, as I said, always start with the most conservative treatment, which even in those furcation involvement, which is non-surgical deprivation. But then again, if things don't improve, you still have the options of periodontal surgery exactly the two categories that I've just explained, open flap deprivement and periodontal regeneration. 
So here's an example of an open flap debridement case. So this tooth, I saw this patient <coughs> two or three years ago. She had an eight millimeter probing depth, grade two furcation on the distal. And if, if you want to have a look at the changes, so you, you can see this is the angular bone defect and use the floor of the sinus as a guide for the coming x-rays. So I did my non-surgical predemptive debridement and there was still calculus. It's a bit embarrassing, but I just, I don't know why, I'm just going to remove it non-surgical. So I referred, so I, so I did the, uh, so I did the, the periodontal surgery, just simple, raise a flap, debride, and suture back again. And now you can see, oh, the calculus of course is gone, but now you can see the difference in the defect from here to here. So this is not an eight millimeter anymore, it's a four millimeters. It's still a great tool. But this is still, this is a, a more accessible scenario, easy to clean and easy to maintain and easy for the patient as well to do good oral hygiene in that case. And then again, one maintenance after the other, it's still a four millimeter, it's still a grade two, it's not bleeding and it's clean. That's all you want, right? Okay, so let's talk about periodontal regeneration for those furcation involvements. So here's an example with a uh, lower molar with a grade two furcation. And again, you know how we said there's two types of periodontal regeneration. That's the first one, put a, putting a membrane here. And as a result, you can see the bone gain comparing this to this. And here's an example of M2 gain. Uh, again, this is a grade two furcation on an upper molar. And the M2 gain is injected in. And then you can see now <coughs> the signs of bone gain and healthy looking gingival tissues. I, I wish there was more time to talk a, a lot more details about indications, contraindications, when to do membrane, when to do endogame, but unfortunately there's not much time for that. So I'm just giving you a little bit of, you know, uh, example of everything. Just a question. Please. So far it just only talks about bone defects, but you haven't combined that with mobility of the tape. I'm sorry, say again? You haven't talked about the mobility of the tape yet, and is that a determination? Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I, I haven't included much about mobility in this lecture, but I'd love to talk about mobility. Uh, maybe, maybe at the end, if you don't mind, because there's, there's quite a lot to talk about here. But thank you so much for, for bringing it up. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we, we're done talking about grade two furcations. Let's go for the next one, grade three furcations. So this is an example. This is an upper motor with a grade three furcation. This is a lower motor with a grade three furcation. So what you can do when there's a grade three furcation is a procedure called tunneling. So what tunneling is really doing is you are basically exaggerating that furcation in the patient's mouth so it becomes more easy for the patient to put their interdental brush and clean between the roots. So here's an example. This is the upper tooth here. So this is when the tunneling was done. And now the patient, you know, you can see that gap here. You can see that gap here. The patient can now put the fixtures in between. And same thing for that lower motor. Again, that was like a seven or eight millimeter probing depth with the grade three furcation. And as a result of the tunneling, the probing depth has now gone down to three millimeters and the patient can easily put that fixture in between, even the big black one. It's very easy. Would that lead to a lot of sensitivity? Look, with, with, with tunneling, the biggest risk is caries, not so much sensitivity. You know, the, the sensitivity is, the, the risk for sensitivity is just the same as doing a non-surgical debridement. You know, you, we all, when you do periodontal debridement, the patient feels sensitive, and then you just have to manage it as we do. So you either give them those toothpaste or ask them to use some uh, high fluoride like, like uh, Duracat and, and, and so on. But, but the, the main issue, the, the main risk is possibility for root caries, but with good hygiene and, and again, just like, what we normally do with caries control, you shouldn't have that, uh, that root caries. Okay, now let's, next, so we finished talking about this one. Now the next one is, this is now as complicated as it can get. So it's a motor tooth with a grade three furcation and bone loss for over or more than a, 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 a communicating and the periodization, which is bone loss more than 100%. So this is an upper six, um, and as you can see here, there is a palatal root there, and you can see the periapical radiolucency. When you look at the CT scan, just to get your bearings right, this is the buccal, and this is the palatal. So you can see that there is bone loss all around the palatal root and beyond the apex as well. 
So what, what can we can do in this case? Uh, and the probing depth here was 10 millimeter on that mid palatal of that upper motor. So what we can do in this case is a procedure called root resection. So what root resection means is basically if, if this is the main problem tooth, and I, speaking of mobility, I intentionally showed you that one where there is a palatal root to be resected. And, but we talk about mobility at the end. Uh, but, uh, so, so, you, so you can do a root resection for that palatal root. So the dentist will first have to do a root canal treatment. So that's what uh, what, my, what the dentist did. She uh, she did a root canal filling on the mesial and the distal root. She just placed an amalgam plug on the palatal, and then this is now the palatal root uh, resected. And you can see this this point here is just where the uh, amalgam plug is. Does that make sense? And this is the palatal root resected. And then eight weeks later, this is how it looks postoperatively. And again, one maintenance after the other, N nothing has changed, and it's not bleeding, and, 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 and the mobility in this case is it, it's 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 an increased mobility to a grade one, but it will it's only a grade one, and it will always be it's not an increasing mobility. And speaking of mobility, when you think about it, that palatal root before being resected, what support was it contributing? It wasn't. There's, there's no. There's already no bone around it. So resecting that root wouldn't have affected the mobility much. Does that make sense? Well, it's not the same case in a single root of two. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You're hundred percent right. But we also talk about it. <laughs> okay. Here's another example of a root resection. This time it's a lower molar. So again, the bone lost to and beyond the distal root. Root, the dentist did the root canal treatment on the mesial, not on the distal, and then the distal root is resected, and this is how it looks after. So, I hope that I've shown you again with those molar teeth, with furcation involvement, that with all of these different categories, that whatever treatment you're doing for those furcations, your aim is to create a cleansable scenario. So you can either look at doing at closing the furcation, and that's what that regeneration is, or exaggerating the furcation, and that's what tunneling is, or eliminate that furcation, and that's what root resection does. Yeah. And again, the aim is always to change the prognosis from an, an unfavorable prognosis to a more favorable prognosis. Now. I just want to point out that all of these examples that I've shown you, okay, these are all site-specific lesions. So there's other factors that that are that, that have to be also in our favor. Okay, so all of these cases, you know, the patients are it should be uh, in good health, non-smokers, um, quite fit, uh, fit and well. Of course, good plug control and good compliance to periodontal maintenance. Without maintenance, none of this is going to be working. Maintenance is extremely important. Now, I want to show you this example, so I, I, again, because these are all examples of site-specific lesions, I want to show you many, many years ago, before implants were, you know, in the pre-implant era, how periodontists used to operate. Now, this is, look, look at all this bone loss and, and this advanced periodontal disease. And this is just one example. There's so many examples of that, and there's so many studies that have done very similar to this. So what, 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 what this author has done is this, so, so look at the amount of, 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 of optimism that he's got here. Yeah? <laughs> so so, so look, at, look at that tooth, for example. Yeah, I think that one, he's probably resected two of the roots and he just left that one. Or look at this here, for example. And he's just, and, and, but that has been followed up for 30 years. And I'm not asking you to do that. That's the, you know, I, I, I don't have the guts to do that personally. But I just want to show you how before implants were out there, the things work and, and it works fine, but only with certain, you know, by, by just doing it the right way and, and, and by putting the patient in those quick, strict maintenance. Okay, so someone might ask me, so then, so what, so then you don't extract any teeth? Is that what you do? You just keep everything and, and, and you don't extract anything? No, I, I do extract some teeth, and, and it, for me, what I've learned at this point is at least during the initial phase of treatment, so during my initial consultation, I would extract very, very few scenarios. So this is a case uh, to show you what I, I, I would, uh, to show you what, when I would personally extract 
at initial treatment, at initial phase of treatment. So I would extract teeth that are non-restorable, like those three, for example. I think you probably most of you agree with me that it's they're not restorable. I would also extract concurrent endoperiod disease with communication plus grade three mobility, because now the grade three mobility here is an important factor because. If, if those two teeth, for example, these are the ones that have combined endoperio and there is grade 3 mobility, and that's because now the, the, the bone loss has actually gone around all three of the roots. So, you know, there's no point in me resecting one when the other two are buggered, you know? So, 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 so this is what I would extract. And then I would also extract third molars that have lost attachment and being inaccessible. But everything else stays everything else stays. This patient had such deep periodontal, pro uh, periodontal pockets, up to 10 millimeters here, up to 10 millimeters here, but now she has four to five millimeters, okay? I mean, to be honest, she's still got a six millimeter, I think somewhere on quadrant one, which we might do an open flat project at some point. Okay, now, uh, if I finish the lecture here, my, I would say my presentation is incomplete, because some of you might ask me, why do I have to go through all of this treatment if I can simply extract the tooth and place an implant? Which is a very, very good question. So my answer to that question is, how about you tell me why you think an implant is a better option? So you might say, I think an implant is a better option because in the implants will have less complications than those treatment modalities that you've explained. We're gonna talk and discuss each of one of those points. You might say, well, an implant would be cheaper than everything that you've just explained. And you might say, because implants will live longer than those treatment modalities that you've explained. So the survival rate of the implant is better. So are any of these comments actually true? So let's see what the literature, how the literature has answered those questions. So starting with the first one, implants have no or less complications. Is that true? So when I was a postgraduate, I had to read 90 articles about implant complications. So I'll just sum them up for you in two slides. Of course, implants have complications. They can be mechanical complications, porcelain fractures, screw fracture, etc., etc. But also what, what's more concerning for me is biologic complications. And those biologic complications include the two main categories, peri-implant mucositis, which is the equivalent of gingivitis, but for implants. So there's no bone loss, but there is signs of gingival inflammation. Or peri-implantitis, where there actually is bone loss. And the thing about peri-implant disease is that peri-implant disease is extremely common. Peri-implant disease is more aggressive than periodontitis. And there's a lot of studies that have shown that. This is an example. This is an animal study here where they have teeth on the dogs and they placed implants on the dogs. And then they, they, they put some, um, some floss and some food traps and stuff like that just, just to, to initiate periodontal disease. And then they sacrifice the animal again and they look under the microscope uh, or, and, and also radiographically. And you can see that the bone loss around the teeth is not as bad as the bone loss around the implant. So peri-implant disease is indeed more aggressive than periodontal disease. And the treatment and the management of peri-implant disease is extremely complicated. It's really very complicated. And, and, and no matter how much you try, you, you never get those satisfactory results that you can get when you do the, 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 the periodontal treatment for teeth. And we know still, until this day, there's no available, there's no evidence that one specific treatment modality for peri-implantitis that's better than the other. So then, do implants, is it true that implants have no or less complications? Definitely not. Okay, now let's go to the other one. Are implants cheaper? So there's, again, studies recently that have tried to look at, 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 at that question. And uh, there's quite a few, but I'm just going to show you one of them, which is a study by this person who I can't pronounce his name, uh, in 2014. So they had a hypothetical scenario, okay? A patient who is in his 50s, and he is expected to live for another 30 years. And this person has a molar fracation, one, two, or three. 
And if you're going to do periodontal treatment for those scenarios, it would be either periodontal, as, as exactly as we've explained, periodontal debridement, open flap, root resection, dietary tissue regeneration, and tunneling. And they compared the cost of that with an implant. So this is the cost of saving the tooth. The most expensive, obviously, would be the root resection, because it involves a root canal treatment and a root resection as well. And comparing this to a single implant, it was more expensive by around $800. And I think, 800 euros, I'm sorry, and I think in Australia, you can probably put the numbers and get something similar to that. So again, and, and what's more important in this study that they showed that it, not just that the implant is more expensive, but again, there is still the risk of the cost of having to manage the implant complications when they happen. So their conclusion was that regardless of the degree of furcation involvement, even whether it's a one or, a, excuse me, or a two or even a three, it's still more cost effective to save the tooth than placing a single implant. Okay, so are implants cheaper? Again, the answer here is no. So the last one point here is implants live, do, do implants live longer? Is the survival rate of the implants better? And to answer this question, I'd like to show you lots and lots and lots of studies that looked at all of these different treatment modalities. And all of them are long-term studies, so up to nine years, up to nine years, and, and large number of patients and large number of cases. And you can see survival rate, 90%, more than 90%. This is non-surgical debridement, open flat debridement. Tunneling, 90%. Root resection, over 90%. Regeneration of angular bone defects over 90%. Look at, look at 16 years, 15 years, 20 years, right? Regeneration of furcation defects, same thing. And how does that compare to implants? Systematic reviews that looked at survival rate of implants show that 5 to 10 years, it's the same. There's, there's no difference. But remember, these studies pooled everyone together, those who have periodontal disease and those who don't have periodontal disease. But really, really, if you just put together those who have periodontal disease, they are at much higher risk, that's evidence again, at much higher risk of implant failure than those who don't have periodontal disease. Now, I've shown you, you know, studies that looked at implants separately and studies that looked at teeth separately, but I'm going to show you two studies that I really, really like because they compared in within the study, survival rate of implants and survival rate of teeth. So this is the first one here by Cortellini, 2011. So they had 50 hopeless teeth. Most of them had combined endoperial lesion or loss of attachment almost to the bone. And they divided them into 25 and 25. And 25 of them were extracted and replaced by something, by an implant or a bridge. And the other 25, they had periodontal regeneration. And they followed them up for five years. And at the end of the five years, similar survival rate and similar complication rate. And their conclusion was that regenerative therapy can change the prognosis of a tooth from hopeless to favorable and is a suitable alternative to extraction of such severely compromised teeth. Right? Now, this is, so this is comparing regeneration with implant. I'll show you the next one. This is now comparing root resection with implant. Look at, look at the number of, this is like, again, I like the study because it's a quite a large number. 700 resected molars, 1,500 uh, um, in, implants on, uh, on the molars. 15 years follow up, and again, after the 15 years, similar, very, very similar success rate between the resected molars and the posterior implants. So, do implants live longer? So far, the studies and the evidence does not support that. So if you tell the patient, I'd rather extract the tooth for you and place an implant because it will live longer, it's, it's not even uh, correct information that you're, that you're giving the patient. And so now that I know that implants do not survive more than treated periodontally compromised teeth, and implants have common complications, and their complications are very difficult to manage, and they are not cheaper, then I would personally prefer to, to, to definitely try to save that tooth. 
And if some, but and what's more, even more important is that whatever treatment I try to do for the patient to save their teeth, but if, if something wrong happens, I still have the option of the implant. It's not, it's not, it's still there. Whereas if you start with an implant and it starts to have complications, then you're just stuck with that implant. So just like people ask me, so what? So you don't extract any teeth? And I show you that, yes, I do extract, but you know, in, in, in very specific cases. Again, some people, people tell me, so what? So you don't place implants at all? No, of course I place implants. I love placing implants. It's, uh, when I, the day when I have an implant case, I'm very happy. But again, I do them in, 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 in very specific cases. So when do I personally place implant? Obviously, I would place an implant if a tooth is already missing, yeah? And in that case, it can either be a simple case or it can be a complex case. And when it's complex, then we might be looking at staged or simultaneous augmentation or even sometimes both as well. So here's an example of a simple case. So again, this is an already missing tooth. I, I'm more than happy to place an implant there. So, uh, but in the steps, you have to do your steps in a step-by-step -step manner, very systematic and really plan for it very well. Make sure that you haven't missed anything. Radiographic guides, CT scans, and then the implants can be placed. I, I extracted the eights because, again, this is one of my criteria for extraction, periodontally compromised eights that are difficult to access, and they were both measly uh, drifted like that. And then the final restoration. <coughs> Here's an example of a complex case. Now, this, has, this is a central incisor missing, so cosmetic issue. So there's a bit of a defect here. There's a defect here. So that can be a staged augmentation. So now with the augmentation, it's changed from that to that. And then even when the implant was placed, there was still a little bit of, 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 of thread exposed. So again, more augmentation in that case was done. So I, I would also place an implant when I really feel that, uh, that, that it is indicated for extraction. Like I said, for example, those third, those, um, uh, great three mobility with combined endoperial lesions. But, but when it comes to extraction and placing an implant, I just want to point out here quickly that there, there, there's so much planning to do and, you, and, 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 and maybe, maybe I'm addressing the, the, the younger dentist perhaps, that there is, there is so many steps here, okay? And, and people do things in very different ways. So some people would extract the tooth and then separately do their augmentation and then place the implant. Some would do these two and then later we'll do the, that one, and some will do the extraction and the socket preservation, and then place the implant later, and some will do all three together at the exact same time. So again, different different methods and different ways of thinking, but I have to say that there's really no evidence that one treatment protocol or sequence it, uh, over the other so is better than the other. So 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 don't when when you attend you know lectures that that recommend one way over the other, nothing works the same way for everyone. Every case is different, and every case need to, you need to think about it separately depending on a lot of factors. So, um, so, I hope I didn't take too much of your time. My conclusion here is, in 2019, well, actually, way before 2019, things were all about saving teeth. And then when implants came to our world, uh, implants became the big thing, and then extraction became very, very common, and implants were placed. But now the new paradigm shift because of the complications of implants is back again to saving teeth. And I'd like to finish my, this is my last slide now, with some quotes, not my quotes, but again quotes from the literature and quotes from um, giants in the world of periods. Please let's read them together one point at a time. In no way does the longevity of oral implants surpass the natural tooth even of those that are compromised for periodontal reasons. There sometimes is an overconfidence in implant therapy when saving a great number of natural teeth would have been comparable or even better in the long term. There's no evidence to support early extraction of teeth to preserve bone for later implant placement. Some people say that, you know, you're gonna extract the tooth before you lose the bone so you place the implant. There's absolutely no evidence behind that whatsoever. It makes, may make sense, but it's, it's not correct. It's not true. And then finally, the belief of implants yielding a better long-term prognosis has clearly been rejected in several comparative studies and systematic reviews. <coughs>
So this is a slide that I always like to use at the end. It's just to acknowledge the, my, my professors and the people that I've learned from. And thank you very much, everyone.